Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in Emmett South. I'm Chris Cooper. Spring and summer bring a new season for gardens. It also brings a bunch of gardening problems and questions. Lawns, tomatoes, trees, and more. It's the Q&A show, just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in Emmett South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. This week, we're going to spend the whole show answering viewer questions. Every week we get more questions than we can answer on air. This week we're catching up, showing you some of the questions we did not get to air because of time. We start with a few questions about vegetables. Why are my tomato leaves curling like this? And this is Andy from Memphis, Tennessee. So great pictures, curling leaves. What do you think about that one? And I'm pretty sure you <laughs> yeah. get a lot of questions about <laughs> yeah. that as well. Um, yo, yes. And um, when we when we kind of experience changes in moisture and mm -hmm. changes in temperature, then these kinds of leaf. Um, when I see that question, what I think is physiological leaf roll. Right. Exactly. And so that is when the leaves roll linearly, okay. so kind of curl on the edges, and oftentimes they'll get a little bit tougher mm -hmm. or leather leathery, and so that can be a stress sign. And sometimes it can be rapid changes in moisture. It's been relatively cool and moist and then it got which hot has happened. and dry. Yeah, which, which has happened here in Memphis. <laughs> it happens multiple times mm -hmm. a year. Sure. Um, and so that leaf is kind of reducing its leaf area to collect less heat and so it can be kind of a stress avoidance okay. uh, technique. Pruning can also contribute to leaf rolling if you mm. prune too much. Too much, take okay. off that I didn't know. It's mini yeah. suckers. So you can kind of stress that plant by essentially what you're doing is, you know, rapidly changing its Food sources, okay, right? Gotcha. Yeah, Makes so sense. those can be a couple of things. Okay. Um, now, I don't want to overlook the fact that there can be viruses and also some herbicides that can cause right. cupping and. Which look, you know, one of those pictures did yeah. look like it was yeah. phenoxy herbicide damage. Right. Yeah. The cupping, curling, yeah. the leathery feel, you know, yeah. to those leaves. Weird veins, mm -hmm. you know, strange mm -hmm. patterns in the veins. Mm -hmm. And so those we would look more towards some kind of an herbicide or right. can, yeah. And right. if you're seeing, oftentimes for physiological leaf roll, those leaves will remain fairly green. Okay. There are some oh, uh, viruses that if you see yellowing with some of that curling, like, uh, you know, yellow leaf curl okay. Okay. <laughs> virus. So sometimes color can be an indicator too. Okay, color can be an indicator, okay. What about production though? So overall, um, we typically say that physiological leaf roll isn't a huge barrier okay. to production. Okay. Oftentimes it'll be on the older leaves, which aren't the ones that are doing the most work to feed developing fruit. So as long as it's a minor stress response and it's not something like, you know, massive water deficit or mm -hmm. something, you know, then <laughs> most of the time, and sometimes they'll come out of it. Okay. What if the plant did have phenoxy damage, though, which we think, you know, one of those plants did. Will it grow out of that, you think? It all, it just, it all depends, right? It all depends. And, and the thing about the uh, phenoxy herbicides is if you're planting your tomatoes somewhere in your yard, for the most part, most people use those chemicals to control broadleaf weeds. Right. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be spraying these chemicals, these pesticides above 85 degrees, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Right. It's going to be a problem. And we're seeing a lot more of those lawn herbicides yeah. have mixed modes yes, of action. So yes. sometimes they may have different kinds of herbicides than you thought they yes. might. Yeah. So be careful with yes. using pesticides around yeah. your tomatoes. Tomatoes so. are canaries, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. They're pretty sensitive. <laughs> that's right. That's for sure. I planted turnip green seeds last year. They grew to a certain point and just died. What caused that? And that's Bill in Memphis. Turnip green seeds. They started growing, they just died. Frost. <laughs> Depends on when they planted them. Could it be in the seed itself, maybe? Huh? Too wet, maybe. Could it be too wet? Too right. hot? Well, they're, turnips are winter annual. Yeah. So if you plant them in the spring, they're not going to do very well. That's right. You know, they're going to come up and they'll die. And, and uh, if you plant them in the fall, they're going to grow through the wintertime and, and and then die 
they'll just die out, you know, in the summer. You know, they're, you know, so I can't think of any disease that would wipe them out. But, you know, and I don't know what, whether wet. he's talking, are you talking about in, you know, shortly after they came up? Right. Or after you've been able to harvest them and you know get some good out of them, or you know, my, a lot of questions. It brings right. on more. Because the timing issue yeah. would be Could my be. guess. Timing. They just maybe did it too early, and then it was too hot, and and then the sun got them, and then they maybe wilted. Right. Um, or it could have been too wet, as we you know said before. We just don't know. But there's mm -hmm. a lot of questions. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. You know about that. Yeah. Um, good seeds. Could have been good seeds. Good Bible seeds. I mean, they did grow, but we don't know. He said to a certain point, we don't know what that point is, but. Uh, it, just, it just brings on a lot of questions, but the bottom line on term, they're usually very easy to grow. Sure. Pretty easy. easy. If you have easy. adequate moisture and adequate fertility, you plant them at the right time, plant them in the fall. Right. And, uh, you know, they'll, they should have turnip greens for a while. Okay. Tree fungus and moss is growing on my peach trees. It is killing my trees and all of my peaches are brown rotting. What do I need to do to save my peach trees from moss and fungus? And this is Doug. Hi, right, Mr. <clears throat> Dave. We got a lot of things going on here, right? Yeah. Tree fungus, moss, brown rotting, which you always tell us happens right, <laughs> to right. peaches, right? You know, bless your heart, you got peach, you got peach <laughs> yeah, trees. Right. Uh, the only thing you can do to, to <laughs> keep a peach tree alive okay in, in a homeowner situation is to spray and spray and spray oh, and spray man. and uh, uh, if you don't you will have brown rot yeah you always say and yep. brown rot affects the fruit mm -hmm. it affects the leaves and it affects the stems wow mm -hmm. and and it can it can it can kill the tree uh, if you don't spray you will also if you're lucky enough to have fruit, you will have plum curculio. Mm -hmm. You'll have a little worm or several worms in every fruit because the plum curculio just does that. She, she finds, that female finds that fruit. She makes a little semicircle cut, lays an egg under it. And so you can, if you see a little half moon scar on the fruit, you know that somewhere in there, there's a larvae tunneling around and, right. and enjoying himself. Uh, you will have white peach scale, which is one of the things that, that, that I think they're talking about when they're talking about uh, moss growing moss on growing it. That's right. probably white peach scale. It'll completely cover, circle the trunk, circle the, the, the limbs, yeah. lower limbs, and wherever the white peach scale is, that part of the tree will die. Wow. And so if it circles the trunk, the whole tree will die. Wow. The University of Tennessee has a home mm -hmm. orchard spray mm -hmm. guide and uh, you need to, in order to prevent these things from happening, you need to spray, uh, the delayed dormant spray in late winter with oil, right. an oil emulsion, and that will help you on the scale control. It'll also help you with aphids and mites. Okay. At bloom, spray with a fungicide, and Captan is the one that we recommend, and <coughs> late bloom or petal fall, do that again, and you can use Captan or sulfur or chlorothalonil another fungicide. At shuck split, you need to go back and spray again with captan or sulfur or chlorothalonil, but you need to kick in an insecticide. Malathion wow. is the insecticide wow. that we recommend at shuck split. And then, <laughs> and, that, and that's seven days after, shuck split is usually about a week after petals have all fallen okay. off. Mm -hmm. And then cover sprays at 10 to 14 day intervals with captan or sulfur as a fungicide plus malathion. And you need to do that up until harvest. If you spray and it rains and washes your spray off, these, these sprays are preventative in nature. Right. And if the mother nature decides to wash your spray off, you need to pretend like you didn't spray and go out there and do it again. Wow. And that means if you spray and it rains tomorrow, you got to go back and spray again. If it rains, you know, and it's really, really hard to keep the cover spray on there. Additionally, to, <laughs> additionally, oh gosh, another insect that will kill your peach trees is the peach tree borer. Mm -hmm. And there's the lesser peach tree borer, yes. which gets in the upper limbs, which will just kill the limbs that they get in it. But the regular peach tree borer gets down at the base of the plant 
And if it does that, it will kill that peach tree. And they're very, very common. And in order to prevent that from happening, you need to go with trunk and main scaffold sprays, okay. May 31st in Tennessee, June 30 and July 15. But you need to check with your local extension right, office right. where you are to find out the times to do that. Right. Uh, with esphenvalerate or gamma cyhalothrin insecticide, those are the two insecticides that are recommended to control the, the uh, uh, peach tree borer. And then pre-harvest sprays, two to three weeks before harvest, captan, plus either thiophanate methyl, immunox, or propiconazole. Fungicide. So, it's so much. And, and, oh then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then if you've done all that and you succeeded <laughs> you and you that. had a good crop, oh, yeah. next fall, Early, do an early dormant spray in late fall after the leaves have dropped with copper, uh, chlorothalonil, or liquid lime sulfur. So, and that's all from the home orchard spray home guy. Home orchard spray guy. So I would suggest you get you one of these, you laminate it, because <laughs> you're gonna want it out in your, in your, in your shop, right. and you just need to, and you need to do that, or, Go to I your local you store I, and buy yeah, you some peaches. Right. It's a lot cheaper to buy peaches than it is <laughs> to try to produce them. <laughs> you know, uh, they're they're really really hard. And same thing's true for plums. Sure. Peaches and plums, they're in the same category. Wow. What type of post emerge can I use on my Bermuda grass to kill weeds? And this is Larry. All right, so I have a couple of questions here though. Okay, he wants to kill weeds with a post emerge, which means the weeds are already up. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's but here's the deal, what kind of weeds though? We, we don't know if they're broadleaf weeds, we don't know if they're grass weeds, and we don't know if they're sedges. Right. So we have to know that first before we can actually recommend what to use. Right. But before I like to recommend chemicals, I always go through cultural practices first. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure you're growing a good dense stand of Bermuda mm -hmm. to begin with. And maybe you won't have those weed problems. If you irrigate properly, okay, fertilize according to your soil test, you can grow it thick stand of Bermuda mm -hmm. that could withstand some of those weeds. But he's asking for a post-emerge. So if you had, or if he had, uh, broadleaf weeds, then you can go with a broadleaf weed killer. And most of those are gonna contain uh, 2,4-D, dicamba, MCPP, which is mecoprop. Uh, read and follow the label on that. These are, again, broadleaf weed killers. They're oxins. Uh, it makes those weeds pretty much grow themselves to death, mm. okay? So that's for broadleaf weeds. Right. If you have sedges, then you have to go with something that contains emazequin, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the chemical active ingredient. Mm -hmm. Again, read the label on that. And then if you have a grass growing in your Bermuda, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. I mean, because you might just get out there and just pull it yourself. Yes. Uh, but again, uh, Mr. Larry, it would help to know what type of weed that we're talking about mm -hmm. before we can actually recommend uh, something for you to control it. Mm -hmm. All right. Would you agree? Absolutely. You don't have to know what specific right. weed. You just have to know if it's broadleaf, a sedge, or a grassy weed. Right. And you can tell that sedges have triangular mm -hmm. stems. Mm -hmm. A grassy weed, the veins of the leaf will be parallel That's like right. a, a blade of grass. Right. Some monocot. Right. And a, yes. Mm -hmm. And a broadleaf weed will have a central vein and webbed veins coming off to the side on a broadleaf. Uh, weed leaf. That's right, and most of your broad leaf weeds have flowers. Okay, right. that's true. I have several crepe myrtles that were damaged by the late freezes. Mm -hmm. My crepe myrtles have very small shunts that are now coming out of them. Will they make it? And this is from Jerry. So, what do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. I had the same problem. Okay. Um, that it, the, the shunts are the, from ambrosia beetles attacking oh. the crepe myrtles. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't want ambrosia beetles around, I took the option of cutting that main branch down wow. and letting shoots from the base come up. And that worked. So it worked? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, crepe myrtles are hardy. And even though we got that cold weather mm -hmm. and the tree was probably stressed, which is why the Definitely ambrosia stressed. beetles attacked it in the first place. Right. So I just cut it all down and let it get the carbohydrates, bring up new shoots, and then they bloom that in, in the end of the year. So yeah. yeah, I. it depends on what he wants to do, but I would want to get rid of the ambrosia beetle. 
myself. Yeah, which is going to be tough to do. Yeah, well, that, when, beetle, when you cut it off, the that whole stalk off, yeah. and then get rid of it, right. then you get rid of the ambrosia beetle. Right. You let the tree come back out again, and you can pick it up and make it a tree, or you can let it be a shrub, right. whatever you want to do. Right, because the ambrosia beetle is a problem. You know, mm -hmm. it will attack healthy and stressed trees. That's true. And it's usually the fungus that it lays inside, you know, the cambium layer that's the big problem. Right. Right, so of course it will stop you know, the uptake of water and nutrients to the upper canopy. So that could be a huge deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right, if you just cut it off, you don't have to worry it's about gone. that. And it's still alive because he said it's coming out from the bottom. That's right. Well, so let it, let it come a few on. shoots, let it come up, and it'll still bloom this year. My spruce tree is over 20 years old. Last year, it began browning at the bottom. It is spreading toward the top. The spruce is partially in the shade of a pecan and beside a dogwood. What is causing this dying? What do I do to save this tree? And this is Joy in Brighton, Tennessee. So we have some brownie. Yes. It's a spruce. It's a spruce. Tree. Mm, spruce. Here in the Mid-South. In the Mid-South. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it, for one thing, it doesn't like to be here. Right. But the fact that it's been 20 years and yes. it's, that's fantastic. That's good. Um, it's dying, uh, could be stressed. Now, this last summer, we've had some of the worst drought mm -hmm. we've had in 15 years. Mm -hmm. So that could probably be part of it. But the, more importantly, because it's not planted in its native habitat, and maybe we've had some really dry weather, um, it's stressed. Yes, definitely stressed. And when Colorado blue spruces get stressed around here, they get spider mites. And I think the spider mites are what is trying to finish off his Colorado spruce. Right. So let's fix it. Let's uh, put some insecticide or horticulture oil yes. on it. Mm -hmm. Anything to smother the, the mites that are on there. And you cannot see them. Right. There, there's, a, there's a mites you're not going to be able to see with the naked eye. In fact, you'll have to get uh, some kind of magnifying, high-powered magnifying uh, lens to be mm -hmm. able to see them. That's right. So if you took it to your extension office locally, you could probably get get them to look at it under magnifying glass for right. you and to see that. And they could verify that for you, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, Walter, anything you'd like to add to that? No, just probably some product that contains a manic culprit. Right, as a uh, soil as drench? A, yeah, right. yeah, as a soil drench or something okay. will help it. Right. But stress. It's a stress. Right, because yeah. it is a spruce, mm -hmm. right, growing out of its native habitat. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we did have a pretty severe drought uh, last year. So I, but he's gotten 20 wonderful 20 years. years. That's I great. That's good. What is happening to my azaleas? Some of the leaves are yellow and spongy. What is causing this and how do I treat this problem? This is Nita from Memphis, Tennessee. Gotten a lot of questions. Yeah. Especially this, this spring. This time of year. Because this right this is yes. azalea leaf galls yeah cool wet, wet. spring yes right? yeah fungal spores are in the air uh -huh. you know those fungal spores get deposited on the leaves of your azaleas and it creates the azalea galls. leaf galls so what do you do about that i don't know of any chemicals mm -hmm. that are do, that can you know work for this or even to prevent it yeah. um, i had an internship and we had to go around and pull the oak leaf galls <laughs> off of all of the azaleas in, you know, after they finished blooming uh -huh. and then fertilize them after they finished blooming too. So I, so that's what you I have to do. Right? I have picked many an oak leaf gall off of azaleas, but that's just the only way that I know of to do it's it. It's the only way I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. Just pull them off. Uh, because again, like you mentioned, no fungicide is needed. Yeah. All right, just go ahead and pull them off if you can reach them. If not, they'll fall off to the ground. Pick them up Pick them because up, yeah. there are fungal spores there uh, and just deposit them, uh, you know, in your trash. And that's why, you know, you collect them. It's best to not just leave them, to collect, yeah, collect them, them and throw them away because, you know, it will just keep getting worse. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't. So the azalea leaf galls, yeah, and of course, cool wet springs. Yeah. yeah. I started asparagus in pots because the area I wanted them in wasn't ready yet. It is still not ready, but the pots are disintegrating. <laughs> what should I do? Is it okay to transplant asparagus in July into hard soil? And I like this. It is hard pan clay. And I've added gypsum, compost, and vermiculite 
but it hasn't done the job <laughs> just yet. This is Annie on YouTube. I like that. So what do you think? Has she transplanted yeah. asparagus in July? But here's the thing. In hard soil. Yeah, so we've got a combination of things there, <laughs> and um, and so one thing I'll I'll throw in for some I of don't yeah don't some of your northern viewers, right? Where okay. can you grow great asparagus? Right, <laughs> sandy Michigan soil, right? Yeah. So you know, asparagus likes lighter, okay. well-drained soil. All right. So I'll start there. Mm. Mm. It's gonna be hard to grow that here, huh? Mm. With the hard soil. Yeah, and and of course July <sighs> heat. heat. And that's going to be the time when the asparagus would be, you know, trying to form its food and, uh -huh. you know, doing the work that's going to support next year's, um, you know, edible structure. So, <laughs> yeah, do lie. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, I guess my question would be, what are the chances that, you know, a raised bed might be available uh, okay. for those plants? Okay, mm. okay. All right. And depending on where you are, when do they need to get in the ground, though? Right, and so we would typically put those in in the early spring. Right. Yeah, and also another thing that sometimes sometimes we'll slowly harvest on our asparagus as well. So oh. it might be a few years old before we get to full right. productivity. Okay. And so there's lots of things that we're focusing on on that young asparagus plant to try to make sure that it gets a strong, you know, root structure. To, All right to get going. No, that makes sense. So transplanting in July, I don't think it'd get that strong root. It'd be, it'd be a challenge. It'd Maybe be a challenge. larger pots, raised beds. Um, but yeah, this spring we've all, we've all probably got some plants sitting on our porches. I would like my nine year old Sheffalera plant to be fuller and thicker at the bottom. It has only two long stems that have to be tied to a center support to keep it upright. It is approximately three feet tall. How should I prune my Sheffalera to make it fuller? And this is Sandra in Oakland, Tennessee. Joellen, she wants to prune it to make it fuller. And she's very fuller. right, that's correct. <laughs> she's very right. Um, it's three feet tall. Well, um, in, I, it doesn't take very much because what she's got, if she's got two major stems, that's it's you got to think about apical dominance. Oh, look at you! And right. the, the each <laughs> stem has got an apical dominance. Uh -huh. We cut the apical dominance off, and then the branches on below it break. Okay. So that's going to make it more full. Uh, it doesn't matter how much she cuts it because whatever, wherever she cuts it, she's going to break that apical dominance. So it's up to her of how much she wants to cut, but she should cut each stem. And then that will help all the, the other branches break out and be more full. So cut each stem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, uh, however much she wants, because it doesn't matter. Okay. She doesn't will matter. she will take out that apical dominance of wow. each one, and she'll have a fuller plant. Wow. It would have been nice to have a picture just to see it. You yeah, know, just it to is. get some, yes, you know, get some little, idea. Nice. Uh, Why anything you want to add to that? I don't know a whole lot about house plants, but I think <laughs> with those particular plants, when you cut them, if you cut it like on the uh, inside, like will that make it grow the shoots towards the insides, the, the ones that's gonna come after? Uh, yeah, it depends on where the leaves come okay. out. Okay. That's where the leaf margin is where the next stem is gonna come out. Okay. So okay. yeah, it depends on, yeah, you can direct the, d okay. the way we'll that the plant the grows. Go to the outside yeah. instead of the inside. It's true. Okay. That's true too, yeah. I have two pear trees. Mm -hmm. One flower is about two weeks before the other. Is there something I can do so two pear trees flower at the same time? And this is uh, Lynn. So ah. what do you think about that? <laughs> I think she's got two different varieties of pear trees because all the same varieties usually bloom about the same time. And she can look at it this way. She gets an extended period of bloom in her yard because one blooms for a couple of weeks and a couple of weeks later the other ones bloom. So she has a succession of blooms for her pear trees. Yeah, that's what I think it is. It's just two nice. different varieties, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get the same ones, yeah, they bloom at the same time. If you don't, yeah, yeah. One is a couple of weeks or so after the other. That's right. Um, yeah, because outside of that, I don't know what else you could do about no. it, you know, basically. Yeah. No. Probably nothing. No. Mother Nature is going to be Mother Nature. What causes yellow leaves on tomato plants? And this is Anne in Crump, Tennessee. Common question that we normally get. So, what do you think? 
Well, I guess we can kind of start to throw out some options and maybe narrow it down, give a little bit more information. So we would think about nutritional items as one first option, of course. You know, we've already, you know, we always want to talk about making sure, you know, your soil test and make uh -huh. sure your sure. nutrition is correct. Okay. And so yellow leaves can actually be, well, more than one nutrient, but nitrogen is often nitrogen, what we think right. first, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we usually see that with the lower leaves, yeah. for the most part, the yeah. older leaves, right? And so nitrogen is a nutrient that's mobile in mm -hmm. the plant. So the reason we see it on the older leaves is because when it starts to be deficient, <laughs> it'll translocate up to the spots in the plants that it really wants to grow those new leaves. So where we see those yellow leaves are a pretty important diagnostic right. element for us. Okay. Um, other things that we would often see on the lower leaves first could also be disease mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And some of what the blights come to mind for me, of yeah. course, uh, with that. So that definitely could be a yeah. problem. So early blight lots of times mm -hmm. we'll see mm -hmm. as it moves up the plant. And of course that won't just be yellow. We'll see browning oh, yeah. It'd be more than and yellow. yeah That's right. target spots, but right. but that could be that could be some elements. And there can even be some um, sap feeding insects that okay. could even Like cause aphids them. or something like that? Okay. Yeah. All right. So a lot of different, uh, yeah, choices it could be. All yeah. Right. So make sure you get out there and scout, Miss Ann, all right? Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for sending in the questions. They keep us on our toes. To get more information on any of the questions we answered today, go to familyplotgarden.com. Thanks for watching and keep sending in the questions. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.